Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the final part of this conference. We had so many beautiful presentation, interesting speakers. And we have one more exceptional presentation uh, as a final part of this conference. And I'm delighted to introduce Professor Bill Gedemir Koz, uh, Director of uh, Research and Application Center for Space and Accelerator Technologies at in the Middle East University of Ankara, Turkey. Please, Bilge, the stage is yours. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here in Azerbaijan. Uh, it's my first time in this beautiful country, and I thank you very much for your hospitality and also to Jaunt. Uh, so today, I'm going to try and take on an ambitious goal, and I'm going to try to talk to you about a prelude to a long journey, and I'm going to try uh, to go from big data to scientific wisdom. So my journey, this journey, starts with CERN. CERN is located on the border between France and Switzerland, uh, and it is here, close to Geneva, you can see the Geneva Airport here, the Geneva Lake, the Jura Mountains, and uh, probably quite famous now is the Large Hadron Collider. CERN was founded in 1954 for four specific goals. The first is research and development. The second is uh, technology development. The third being education, and the fourth being uh, international collaboration. Now, I think these fit quite well with the goals of Jayant as well. So, where, what are we looking at? We're looking at this really large accelerator, 27 kilometers around it, where particles are accelerated very close to the speed of light. How close, you say? Well, it's 99.999998% of the speed of light. And believe me, that's only a bike's bicycle speed away from the speed of light. Only a bicycle speed slower than the speed of light. That's, so that's quite fast. And I was there last week, and I still can't get my head around it. But particles travel around this ring 11,200 times per second. 27 kilometers. It's mind-blowing. I still, you know, I've been in this business for 25 years. I still can't get my head around it, and I don't know anyone who does. Okay, so don't feel bad about that. So what do we do inside this ring? If you were to go inside it, which is about 100 meters underground, uh, why is it, okay, of course you must know angels and demons and all these conspiracy theories, right? Why is it 100 meters underground? Well, first, Radiation, it's very nice to be underground to protect everyone else from radiation. Two, 100 meters underground, everything is at 18 degrees Celsius, so very stable. And third, where do you get 27 kilometers these days? Uninterrupted land. <laughs> so hence it's underground. And when you go under, underground, you really don't see that it curves very much. It's quite straight. It looks quite straight. Except for, a, you know, if you look down, okay, it curves a little bit, yeah. And uh, what we do inside here is we accelerate protons very close to the speed of light so that they, their mass or their energy at the point of the collision is 7,000 times more than their mass at rest. So if I had to push it a little bit more, I would have to give it 7,000 times more force to accelerate it just a little bit more than I would need to do it at rest. So that's what it means. And this is, of course, due to Einstein's relativity. So when, then we do collide these particles. Why do we collide them? Because we want to understand the basic physics principles that guided the universe to its current state. 
And for this, we build also large detectors. These detectors are like big eyes, and, I, and here, please note the size of the human. All right, so when these particles collide, they make large collisions, with thousands of particles are created at the collision site, and then we are like a detective trying to figure out the moment of the collision. What happened at the moment of the collision? What physics forces were active? Were there any new particles? created? Were there, was there any, anything that went unseen? Is there anything new? You might have heard that we have discovered the Higgs boson at CERN, and there was a Nobel Prize awarded for the discovery of the Higgs boson to, um, to, the, to the theorists. And these collisions, there's a lot of data that you might have also heard. There is an enormous amount of data. But really, how big is the data? So, one of these eyes, each of these eyes, has 150 million channels, and every second, there are 40 million collisions. So if you do that multiplication, which is a scary multiplication, you get a petabyte of information produced per second. Now, there's nothing. I mean, nothing that can record that much information. <laughs> we have no hope. I don't, think, I don't think anybody wants to actually record that much information. This is the information on the front ends of the detector. So what do we do then is we don't record this. We only record the interesting stuff. OK? Not every event gets recorded. Why? Even though we make 40 million collisions a second, we only produce 10 Higgs bosons per second, uh, per, per day, I apologize. We only produce, even though we have 40 million collisions a second, at the end of the day, we have only 10 Higgs bosons in a day. So what I'm saying is that these processes are very rare. All right, so rare that you have to pick and find them, and you have to do this according to the theories that theorists make. So this is called the trigger system. The trigger system is a system which asks you, do you know what you're looking for? If you know what you're looking for, you develop a system which reads this information from the detector front ends at 40 megahertz, and you only read a little bit of this information at the rate of 100,000 times per second. And that goes into a builder network, which builds the events. And this is already 100 gigabytes per second. So we read only at 100 gigabytes per second. But that's still not so little, huh? And this then passes off into an event manager, which is about 5,000 cores which then churn and chug and reduce this to about 100 events per second. And only then we write to disk, and that's about a gigabyte per second. And after we do all of this, selecting, manipulating, we still have, at the end of one year, a petabyte. So this is the scale of our problem. It's a big problem. This, you see, is, uh, well, I took this on Monday morning from uh, CERN. This is a visualization made at CERN of the data that's being produced and sent around the world. This is the EGL. This is the grid. And what you see here is you're seeing about 16 gigabytes per second being transferred around the world between different data centers and then this data being analyzed. We in Turkey have been working with Tubitak Ulakbim. You've already heard from them uh, yesterday. And uh, they started working with CERN 
Uh, their first initiative, with the, grid, the first grid initiative started in 2003. I met them in 2005. Uh, we started uh, some uh, talks. And then we had, in 2008, we signed an MOU between CERN and the Turkish Tier 2 Center. And then since then, they have been ramping up uh, and uh, supporting the Turkish involvement to CERN uh, very, very well. And uh, now this is the current status you see from 2009 to 2022, uh, how the resources have uh, ramped up. We, uh, everything for Atlas and CMS is connected with 10 gigabit links, and the CPU is about 10,000 cores for each, and the disk exceeds uh, a petabyte for each. Uh, the petabyte, uh, the, the funding for the Truba Center uh, comes from the strategy of budget, uh, strategy of budget and about, it's about 60 million euros. Uh, the whole center, the Truba Center, has 25,000 cores and about 14 petabytes of storage. And we have, they have about 4,500 registered users and are supporting about 150 uh, research projects right now. Uh, and uh, they have really, I have used, I've, I've worked with them, I've used their resources, and it's, uh, it's, it's great that they're part of this effort. The reason, the, because uh, Truba contributed, uh, it was one of the uh, contributions for Turkey to become an associate member to CERN. Uh, there's about 150 Turkish scientists working at CERN on CMS, Atlas, and other experiments, as you see here. Not just the LHC, but also on dark matter searches, which I will be talking about later. And we signed this associate membership uh, to, to, of Turkey to CERN on May 2014. And since then, we have been ramping up our research efforts at CERN as a country. And now, I would like to talk about dark matter. I just mentioned in passing. But that's actually what I really do, is I'm a, I, I work a lot about on space research and on trying to understand dark matter in the universe. And one of the, there's a few other things you can do besides the Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider is human made, it's underground. But this idea that you could actually create new particles with accelerating them did not come from us, the humans, it came from space. Originally, it came from space. We already, this field of particle physics already started in space back in 1912 when Dr. Hess discovered something called cosmic rays. So what are cosmic rays? Cosmic rays are particles accelerated very close to the speed of light by stars, by neutron stars, by black holes, by supernova by exotic objects in the universe. And these cosmic rays come and hit our upper atmosphere. And when they do, they shower. And you might know, maybe, that some of the people who receive the highest amount of doses, the radiation dose, on Earth are actually the pilots. Because when a pilot flies, a pilot flies through this thing. He showers. And they receive nearly as much as the radiation workers at, a, at a, um, a nuclear station. It's about the same. And uh, these cosmic rays do not penetrate all the way to, down to Earth. Most of them stop in the atmosphere because the atmosphere is quite thick. But there's about one million passing through you per second, uh, per minute. So there is about one of them passing through you per minute. And this makes for about 30% of the radiation we, we, we receive daily comes from space already. Of course, this goes up if you're a pilot. It's even worse if you're an astronaut. So these cosmic rays is how we learned about particles and subatomic particles in the first place. For example, you might know of the positron, the antimatter of electron. Is, it was discovered first in cosmic rays. And we still continue studying cosmic rays, no longer on, on Earth, but up there on the International Space Station. 
Anybody recognize this? International Space Station, yes? Has anybody seen it by naked eye? One, nobody else? Two, three, okay, four, five, good, good. Okay, nearly 10 people have seen it by eye. You can see the International Space Station with your naked eye, it's quite big. Uh, how big is it? It's as big as a football field. Okay, so that's not small. It was built in space over about 20 years. It's an international collaboration. And on the International Space Station, we have an experiment of particle physics. And it's called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. And it sits on the International Space Station right there. And it's been there since 2012, taking data, and it helped back a long, way, a long time ago, I helped build it. I worked on it for four years, building it. So what is it? It is a large, for space, it's a large particle detector. It's 7.5 tons. It has 300,000 electronic channels, and it has 650 processors, and it's been taking data and sending it to Earth now for 10 years, working quite reliably. It was sent to space in May 2016, uh, uh, 2011. Here it is installed on the International Space Station. And here it is as controlled from the payload operations and control center at CERN. And here, it's an international collaboration of 15 countries. We are a member here, you see, Turkey is also a member and I represent Turkey at this experiment. And we have been working in this international collaboration. There is about 200 of us analyzing the data. And it is a tera electron volt scale. So same scale as the Large Hadron Collider. We're sensitive to the very same physics as the Large Hadron Collider. We're actually complementing the Large Hadron Collider. It's a precision detector up on the International Space Station. And I won't go into the physics. But you can see that it has many, many, many parts measuring the properties of a particle, its charge, its momentum, its energy. And we do this with different detectors again and again and again to make sure that we make the precise and controllable measurement on this particle. Here's an example. I looked just a few minutes ago. We have now 209 billion particles collected as of today in 10 years. And here's a particle that went from up to down. And it left signals in each one of our detectors. And our detectors tell us, oh, this is an electron. Ooh, this is the momentum. Ooh, this is an electron again. Ooh, this is the energy. This is the electron again. So as it goes through, we have information about this particle. And we can tell, for example, this is a 424 giga electron volt positron. And this is, the, again, the scale that we do physics in at the Large Hadron Collider. Why is this interesting? Why is this important? Because we have seen something. We have seen something very interesting. We have seen that at high energies, this is the energy scale, at high energies, there are more positrons than we, more, more positrons than we expect. More positrons. You know positrons are the antimatter of electrons. And there seems to be more positrons than we expect. And we are spending now all our effort, also my team, we're spending all our effort in trying to understand why. And there are some theories why. One of them is dark matter. Maybe out there in the universe, some dark matter particles are annihilating, annihilating, self-annihilating with each other and producing electrons and positrons, which then we see as a signal. This is one possibility. Another possibility is pulsars. Pulsars might produce some extra positrons at high energies. And there might be a pulsar close to Earth that is producing a source term compared to a diffuse term. The diffuse term is what we expect already from cosmic rays. The source term is very interesting. 
So this is the thing that we're trying to understand. And we're going to spend another 10 years upon the International Space Station taking data, trying to analyze this and understand this. And we want to understand this by reducing our error bars and seeing how the spectrum falls. Because how the spectrum falls will give us a handle on whether this is coming from a pulsar as opposed to dark matter. So this is what we're after. Another thing that I and my group has been interested in is space radiation. Now, we've been talking about particles in space. And we talked already about how pilots receive more radiation than you and me. So what if you are in space? It's even worse, right? It's definitely much worse. How bad is it in space? Well, if you go to LEO, which is low Earth orbit, LEO, you get about 100 times more than what you get here on Earth. If you go to MEO, which is middle Earth orbit, you get 100 times more. And if you go to GEO, well, OK, it's about 10 times more. So in space, you get more and more radiation, but in different orbits, different uh, amount of radiation, because the Earth has a magnetic field, and this magnetic field protects us because incoming radiation is trapped in the magnetic fields of the Earth. So incoming particles from the sun come to the Earth and are trapped inside magnetic fields of the Earth, creating what are known as Van Allen belts. And these Van Allen belts actually protect us from other radiation coming at higher, even higher energies. These Van Allen belts are the reason why life started here. If we were on Mars, no magnetic field, and when there's a solar explosion or a solar uh, event, solar event, you get the di radiation directly. You get a sudden increase in radiation. That's not what happens here on Earth. When we get a sudden increase in radiation, this radiation is, these particles are directed towards the North and the South Poles, and we see them as auroras. And here we are in the livable part of the Earth, quite well protected. So this space radiation environment is something also we're studying up on the International Space Station with AMS, and we're trying to understand it better. And this got me, because I work on this, I was tasked I was tasked in Turkey to build an irradiation facility in Ankara, in Turkey, for space research. Here is an accelerator that we have. It's a proton accelerator. And we deliver uh, this beam to an area about the size of an A4 paper for testing electronics and materials. And we built this facility in Turkey almost 90% using resources of Turkey by using the fact that we have become an associate member of CERN and using the technology and knowledge transfer from CERN by science diplomacy. So this has been a loop. But there is one more step to the loop, to complete the loop. There is one more step. We got something from CERN. We, we started by giving resources to CERN, computer resources to CERN. CERN said, oh, become a Remember, we become, we give you some technology and knowledge. Now we create something in Turkey with it. And now what is the last step to give back to CERN again? So we did that too. We built, we designed and built an industrial size quadrupole magnet, a, a, a magnet for the R beam line in Turkey with a company in Turkey, completely produced and done. And then we sent it to CERN, got the tests done at CERN. And now this company is producing magnets for CERN. <laughs> so it's a win-win for both sides, for Turkey and for CERN. Right? Now CERN has more uh, p uh, companies they, they, can, they can get materials produced at. So what's interesting is that, so this is the data that, that humanity has collected on space radiation in the last 70 years. What do we have? We have a lot of uh, so on the x-axis here, you see the dose rate. And on the y-axis here, you have the altitude. 
So this, those rate, you see, increases as you go up in altitude around 10 kilometers, and there's a maximum around 20 kilometers. This data here has been collected by balloons, and then you have a lot of, and then there's some, they, there's place where there's not much data between 30 kilometers, where balloons explode, up to 300 kilometers, which is really the lowest orbit for satellites. And there's, then there's a lot of data collected with satellites, and here you have the camel's back, so to speak, from the magnetic field of the Earth, and then out to uh, interplanetary space. Why is there no data here? Well, because between 30 and 300 kilometers, you can only collect data using rockets, and rockets go pretty fast. So there's, you don't get to collect a lot of data because you don't have a lot of time. So you're statistically limited. So Turkey started a space program, and we got interested, and we said, oh, can we fly on these rockets? That would be interesting. And they said, come along for the ride. So uh, we built a prototype radiation monitor, only half a kilogram, <laughs> not 7.5 tons. <laughs> and we flew to space last year, well, actually one and a half years ago now, uh, twice on top of a rocket coming from Sinop, which is a, a city on the Black Sea coast. And we flew up to 137 kilometers. And the limit of space is 80 kilometers. So we went up to 137 kilometers and then fell back into the Black Sea with our radiation detectors twice. And next year, we're very much looking forward to going up to 350 kilometers. And in three years, we'll be sending our radiation, small radiation detectors into orbit from Turkey, which is really exciting. So I, uh, there's a couple of other people. Where's Chris? Chris. There's another space person out there. Um, we're very excited about this, so I want to share a video with you because this, I get excited because I got to flew, fly on it. <laughs> That was very interesting and exciting for our students uh, as we flew on this rocket and we're looking forward to the next launches. So now I promised you some scientific wisdom. So that's what I'm going to try. And I'm going to try to answer this question about scientific wisdom in three ways. Mind, heart, and the soul. 
right, so let's see how it goes. Let's see how it goes. So, uh, mind. When I think about scientific wisdom for the mind, I'm reminded of the fact that we have a trigger. We have to look for dark matter, but we have to know what we're looking for. We have to have, we take enormous amount of data, petabytes of data, and we take that down to a few gigabytes before we can try to understand it. We have to have a theory, and only using that theory we can make sense of our data. So big data, all of it in one chunk, is not meaningful. When I think about this, and since we're in Azerbaijan, I'm reminded of a story by Ferid Uddin Attar. He wrote uh, Mantikutai, Mant which is a story of 30 birds. These 30 birds traveled beyond the Mount Kaf in search for truth. But they didn't know what they were searching for. They knew they were, they were searching for truth, but they did not have any understanding of what the truth was. But they went above and beyond. They had to fight so many um, obstacles. In this book, there are seven obstacles that they face. And when they reached this mountain, they found a lake in which they would see the truth. They looked at the lake and they saw that all 30 of them was the truth itself. So they learned that truth was actually themselves, that they were, they were actually one bird called Simurg. I think a lot of our friends here are, are uh, familiar with the story as it's part of the folklore here in Azerbaijan. So this gets me to think. We have to know, or at least have some feeling of what we are searching for. And what are we here at this beautiful conference searching for? We're building collaborations and connections here with Jayant in the spirit that we've talked at the beginning. We're building a collaborative spirit. And I have to say, towards what? So I will venture out and say that we're doing this in the hope for world peace. Next comes the heart. Often I'm asked by students mostly, high school students, they say, science is so cold, professor. What is, is there any romanticism in science? And I get to tell them the most romantic thing I know about the universe. And that is a supernova. This is the Crab Nebula that exploded, or we saw it as exploding in uh, 1054, as recorded by the Hubble telescope now. This star produced sodium and aluminum and other elements. And you say, so what? Wait, I say. Do you know what the sun is made of? The sun is made of hydrogen and helium and a little bit of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and that's it. So where did all the calcium in your bones come from? Where did all the iron in your body come from? Well, it came from one of these. Our sun happened to be passing through the debris left over from an explosion and happened to grab the planets behind it. We are not children of the sun. We're children of a dead star. So this is the most romantic thing I know. A star died so you could be alive today. And, well, this reminds me of something. It reminds me of the other name of Simurg. This Simurg, these 30 birds, they lived for many, many thousands of years and they became all so wise. They became so wise, but they became so old. And at some point, they had to die. At that point, they burnt. 
They became ashes. And from their ashes, the Simurgh was reborn. And this is a depiction of this firebird. So to me, this reminds me, as scientists, we're living in a world filled with VUCA. This is, a, this is the latest uh, acronym that everyone's using these days, VUCA. It means volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. We're living in a world filled with these things. And every day as a scientist, I have to reinvent myself. I have to be born from my ashes every other day. When the, my grant proposal that I submitted to Horizon 2020 die as a terrible death, I have to now recreate that into a new grant proposal. I think every one of us has done that. <laughs> so we reinvent and we are reborn every day for our, our, in our search for research funding. So that's my heart. And as for soul, yes, the soul. When someone asks me about where my soul is, I say that my soul is not on this world. It's out there, beyond the moon, looking back at the earth. Here's a photo as taken from Apollo 8. The earth rise, the first time humanity saw the earth rising from the moon in 1968. This, this is our sole spaceship, our ecosystem paragon, our dependable protector from radiation. And it's traveling at 380 kilometers per second through our universe. Our collective intelligence, heart, soul, can complete this journey through the universe. What's burning on this spaceship? This, burning, this, this spaceship burns not oil, not gas, not petroleum. None of this is the fuel of the ship, but greed. Greed is the fuel of the ship. And we need to counter this greed with the scientific wisdom that is our own and our single spaceship. And we need to provide some coolant, right? Scientific wisdom as coolant. And hopefully reach the sustainable development goals. The founder of Turkey, the founder of Turkey, eh? sorry, I, I, we, our country changed its name officially now, so we are Turkey. Eh? Uh, our founder, Atatürk, said, Yurtta sülh, cihanda sülh. Peace at home, peace in the world. So peace, which comes from the mind, as we agreed, is no longer the goal. But it's the prerequisite. It's the prerequisite because this has to survive. And so I have to add to that, we have to be in peace with ourselves in our journey on our spaceship in the universe. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Vilge. This was truly inspiring. And I really hope uh, everyone is contagious with your um, enthusiasm and positivity and that our community never loses hope for world peace.